Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Currently, we have been discussing simple acid base disorders. There are four types and in this session we will discuss respiratory alkalosis. Alkalosis is a condition where plasma pH is more than 7.4. It can happen either due to an increase in plasma bicarbonate or due to a reduction in arterial carbon dioxide. And when there is a reduction in arterial carbon dioxide, which is the primary cause of the alkalosis, we refer to that as respiratory alkalosis. We have seen the slide earlier. This is the artery and that is the vein. Respiratory alkalosis is a condition where there is a primary reduction in arterial carbon dioxide. Normally, it is at 1.2 millimoles per liter or 40 millimeters mercury. That carbon dioxide can be thought of as a repository which is there to balance the bicarbonate that is there in plasma. The bicarbonate being there to buffer the fixed acids. The amount of carbon dioxide in arterial blood is precisely regulated by the lungs so as to keep the pH at 7.4. If there is a certain amount of bicarbonate, the carbon dioxide will be 1 20th of the bicarbonate concentration so as to keep the pH at 7.4. Ventilation is therefore adjusted so as to keep the carbon dioxide normal around 40 millimeters mercury and even more to keep the pH of arterial plasma at a normal value. When blood moves into the veins, extra carbon dioxide is added and the carbon dioxide that is produced from the tissues is cleared by the lungs in that respiratory cycle or in the subsequent one or two cycles so that the amount reaching the arterial blood is the same 40 millimeters mercury. If the tissue output of carbon dioxide changes then if ventilation has not changed then the amount reaching the arterial blood will change. Any change in carbon dioxide say an increase in carbon dioxide will be sensed by what are called central chemoreceptors in the medulla oblongata. They are located close to what we call the respiratory center which generates the impulses for the respiratory muscles to produce inspiration and expiration. If ventilation has not matched to eliminate the carbon dioxide that was formed in tissues, then there will be slight change in arterial carbon dioxide that will stimulate the central chemoreceptors which in turn will stimulate the respiratory center and ventilation in the next one or two cycles will be adjusted so as to keep the levels of carbon dioxide at 40 millimeters mercury. That is how precisely arterial carbon dioxide is regulated. If that is the case, why would we have a respiratory alkalosis, a reduction in arterial carbon dioxide? One situation where this may occur, we have seen already, when there is a metabolic acidosis due to derangements in the kidney or due to extra fixed acids coming into blood, when bicarbonate levels decrease primarily and if that is the cause of acidosis, then the change in pH due to that will be minimized by reducing arterial carbon dioxide as well. Here, the central chemoreceptors would have responded to the reduction in pH and therefore would have increased ventilation so as to eliminate more carbon dioxide than what is produced in the tissues so that arterial carbon dioxide levels are reduced 
in such a manner to prevent a gross reduction in pH that is what we call respiratory compensation to metabolic acidosis. The hypocarbia in metabolic acidosis is a compensatory mechanism where the central chemoreceptors are responding to the changing pH and not to the changing carbon dioxide. But we are referring to something else now. We are referring to a case where the lungs are blowing out more carbon dioxide than what is produced even while the plasma pH is normal and even while the arterial carbon dioxide is normal. For some reason, the lungs are eliminating more carbon dioxide than what is produced and that is the cause of alkalosis. Since arterial carbon dioxide is controlled precisely by the amount of alveolar ventilation, that is the amount of air reaching the alveolus in a given period of time, any decrease in arterial carbon dioxide can be brought about only by an increase in ventilation or hyperventilation is the only cause of respiratory alkalosis, the carbon dioxide here will reduce. We need to consider this term hyperventilation carefully. Let us take the case of exercise. There is an increased production of carbon dioxide and alveolar ventilation would have increased so as to eliminate that excess production. This case where ventilation matches carbon dioxide production is not technically considered hyperventilation although there is an increase in alveolar ventilation. The term hyperventilation some physiologists like to restrict the usage of the term hyperventilation to conditions where carbon dioxide formation is less than the amount of carbon dioxide eliminated and that is the only cause of respiratory alkalosis. Now we will see why there should be hyperventilation. Why should the lungs eliminate more carbon dioxide than what is produced? Before we go on to that, let us look at carbon dioxide dynamics yet again. In arterial blood, now the arteries are on top. In arterial blood, let us say there is 40 millimeters mercury carbon dioxide. Now that is there to keep the pH at 7.4 even while bicarbonate in plasma is about 24 millimoles per liter. When this blood moves into the venous side, the carbon dioxide produced in the tissues enters blood, only some of it is in the dissolved state and carbon dioxide concentration of plasma increases to 1.35 millimoles per liter or a PCO2 of 45 millimeters of mercury. The rest of the carbon dioxide would enter red blood cells and get converted to bicarbonate with the assistance of carbonic anhydrase. The bicarbonate will move out into plasma and will travel as an extra bicarbonate in addition to the bicarbonate that is already there. This is what we refer to as erythrocyte bicarbonate in earlier lectures. In the pulmonary circulation, some of the dissolved carbon dioxide is exhaled and some of the plasma bicarbonate would re-enter red blood cells, get converted to carbon dioxide and move out. So that in the pulmonary circulation, whatever was formed in the tissues is eliminated. Blood is already arterialized having 40 millimeters mercury partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Now let us see what happens in respiratory alkalosis. Let the brown rectangles here represent the carbon dioxide that was formed in the tissues and all this carbon dioxide would normally be eliminated in the lungs. But in respiratory alkalosis as it develops, the lungs not only eliminate the carbon dioxide that was formed in the tissues but additional carbon dioxide that was there in arterial blood which is why the levels of carbon dioxide in arterial blood go down. Therefore, respiratory alkalosis is a state where there is excess carbon dioxide eliminated. 
in excess of what was produced. Just to complete the picture, when carbon dioxide levels drop, in order to limit the change in pH, bicarbonate concentration also decreases because the kidneys eliminate some bicarbonate. We now have to see mechanisms leading to an increase in ventilation, thereby eliminating more carbon dioxide than what is required. Hyperventilation is the only cause of respiratory alkalosis. Why would hyperventilation occur? Why would ventilation occur at all? There is a respiratory center in medulla oblongata which sends impulses to the cervical spinal cord and from there spinal nerves, the phrenic nerve supplying the diaphragm and the intercostal nerves supplying the intercostal muscles which are muscles of respiration. This is the neural control that adjusts ventilation. The respiratory center receives various stimuli and in response to those stimuli it adjusts the movement of respiratory muscles so as to control ventilation. There are three important receptors whose input goes into the respiratory center. These are the peripheral chemoreceptors which respond to a low arterial oxygen low PO2 in arterial blood or low dissolved oxygen in arterial blood. The peripheral chemoreceptors are located in the carotid bodies and aortic bodies. The central chemoreceptors are located in the medulla oblongata close to the respiratory center and they respond to an increase in carbon dioxide. Then we have what are called J receptors, J for juxtapulmonary capillary. They are situated in between the alveolar wall and the pulmonary capillary, capillary. At least that was what was initially thought and therefore they were called juxtapulmonary capillary receptors or J receptors by the pioneer who worked in this field, A. S. Paintel. Professor Autar Singh Paintel who was the director of Indian Council of Medical Research and who served in various capacities in Vallabhai Patel Chest Institute, Delhi. He did pioneering work on cardiopulmonary reflexes, autonomic reflexes and the credit for most of the work regarding J receptors goes to him. Now they are not called J receptors, they are rather called pulmonary C fiber receptors because they are found all over the lungs, not just in the juxta capillary position. We will see what stimuli can stimulate the J receptors, but the J receptors can also stimulate the respiratory center. In addition, a number of brain stimuli can stimulate the respiratory center. The easiest to understand would be voluntary hyperventilation. Stimuli from the cortex with volition, you can control your respirations to a certain extent. You can stop breathing for a while, only for a while. Once carbon dioxide levels build up in arterial plasma and go above a certain value, you can no longer hold your breath however strong your will is. Similarly, you can hyperventilate for a short while and if you continue to hyperventilate voluntarily blowing off so much carbon dioxide from arterial blood, you will faint and the hyperventilation will stop. So there are a number of brain stimuli like volition which can stimulate the respiratory center. These are some examples, emotional stimuli and in some cases head injury or stroke which is a cerebrovascular accident can inadvertently stimulate the respiratory center. Some chemicals can also stimulate the respiratory center. Progesterone is something you would know and in fact I am told that progesterone is now even used therapeutically when doctors need to stimulate the respiratory center. These are all the stimuli which can stimulate the respiratory center. We now have to look at instances where the respiratory center is stimulated even when arterial carbon dioxide levels are normal and that would result in blowing off excess carbon dioxide, reduction in arterial carbon dioxide 
and consequent alkalosis. Let us take the instance of central chemoreceptors first. The stimuli for central chemoreceptors is physiologically an increasing carbon dioxide level or a decreasing pH. And when the central chemoreceptor is stimulated like in metabolic acidosis where there is a decrease in pH or in respiratory acidosis where there is a decrease in pH and an increase in carbon dioxide. These are the conditions where central chemoreceptors will be stimulated and they readjust carbon dioxide and pH. But we are talking about conditions where even when arterial carbon dioxide is normal and therefore central chemoreceptors are not stimulated, other stimuli stimulate the respiratory center so as to increase ventilation. Therefore, we will take off central chemoreceptors from the picture. Now, we have the set of conditions which can induce respiratory alkalosis. Let us consider stimulation of peripheral chemoreceptors. Peripheral chemoreceptors are stimulated only by a reduction in arterial oxygen. Hypoxia is a state where arterial oxygen is lower than normal. Normally arterial PO2 is about 95 millimeters of mercury and th when that reduces peripheral chemoreceptors can be stimulated. These are located in the carotid bodies and the aortic bodies. When we consider the term hypoxia, what we mean is that there is a reduced oxygen supply to tissues. And in respiratory physiology, you will learn that there are four types of hypoxia. What are these types? Briefly, suppose this is normal blood. Yellow is plasma and these are the red blood cells. Oxygen is carried in plasma, very minimal quantity. But the oxygen that is dissolved in plasma is what gives rise to the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood, which is PO2. And the redness here, let us say, represents the amount of oxygen held in red blood cells, held in hemoglobin. When dissolved oxygen is about 100 millimeters mercury or 90 millimeters mercury, hemoglobin is fully saturated. In fact, when dissolved oxygen is even lower, even about 85, 80 millimeters mercury, hemoglobin will be fully saturated. Now, in what we call hypoxic hypoxia, by that we mean that the amount of dissolved oxygen in plasma is less. You see that the hue is lighter than here. And when the amount of dissolved oxygen or the PO2 is less, hemoglobin saturation is also less. This is the condition where peripheral chemoreceptors will be stimulated. What about anemic hypoxia? PO2 is normal and oxygen saturation is normal, but there are fewer cells and therefore the amount of oxygen carried to the tissues is less. That is anemic hypoxia. I am not going into the details of stagnant and histotoxic hypoxia. They will be considered in respiratory physiology. What I am coming to say is that among these four types of hypoxias, it is only hypoxic hypoxia that will stimulate the chemoreceptors, peripheral chemoreceptors, induce a hyperventilation and therefore lead to respiratory alkalosis. Now, if you look at textbooks, anemic hypoxia and stagnant hypoxia. Stagnant hypoxia is the blood is not moving so well because the heart has failed. It is not pumping effectively and therefore the stagnation. In these two conditions, also a respiratory alkalosis can develop. And why so? It cannot be due to stimulation of peripheral chemoreceptors because we have just seen that PO2 and oxygen saturation of hemoglobin are normal in these two conditions. Peripheral chemoreceptors are stimulated only by hypoxia. In these two instances, probably the J receptors are stimulated. In cardiac failure, when the left heart is not pumping adequately, then there is build up of pressure in the pulmonary circulation and there will be fluid exudation resulting in what we call 
interstitial edema first, it can progress on to fluid within the alveoli what we call alveolar edema. In these instances, the J receptors may be stimulated. The exact stimulus for J receptors is not just this, it is a multimodal receptor responding to different stimuli. But in the case of anemic hypoxia and stagnant hypoxia, J receptor stimulation may be the cause for hyperstimulation of the respiratory center resulting in hyperventilation and consequent alkalosis. Now, fluid in the alveolus, even these two terms pneumonia and consolidation refer to fluid in the alveolus. Consolidation and pneumonia may refer to fluid in the alveolus due to infective etiologies. Pneumonic consolidation is due to acute bacterial infections, but consolidation can also result from chronic infections like tuberculosis. In all these three conditions, there will be fluid in the alveolus and that will increase the distance through which oxygen has to travel to enter circulation. When the thickness of the membrane, what we call the respiratory membrane, that is the alveolar wall and the capillary wall, that is the thickness of the membrane across which gases have to be exchanged. And in these conditions, we can think of the thickness of the membrane being more than usual. And in these conditions, you can also get a low arterial oxygen, a low PO2 that may stimulate peripheral chemoreceptors. That hypoxia may also stimulate the peripheral chemoreceptors. We have to get a little careful here. One central tenet of respiratory physiology is that in these conditions, it is only oxygen transfer that is affected and not carbon dioxide elimination. So, in these conditions, while there may be a hypoxia and if that stimulates the respiratory center, the resulting hyperventilation will remove excess carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide elimination is not going to be affected by these conditions. Carbon dioxide elimination is dependent only on the amount of alveolar ventilation. If some of the alveoli are fluid filled, then in the remaining alveoli or in the remaining space available, ventilation can happen adequately so as to remove carbon dioxide. And this type of a state where there is hypoxia but carbon dioxide levels are normal or low is what is referred to as type 1 respiratory failure. The best example of hypoxic hypoxia is high altitude where there is rarity of oxygen in the atmosphere. We will list all these causes yet again when we summarize. For the sake of completion, an altered VQ ratio or ventilation perfusion ratio is another cause for type 1 respiratory failure. The details will be considered in respiratory physiology. Other stimuli which can result in inadvertent ventilation are what are listed here. They were talked about even earlier. In addition to the causes that we saw in the last slide which lead to hyperventilation or respiratory alkalosis, a very important iatrogenic cause is excessive ventilation with a mechanical ventilator. In patients needing respiratory assistance or in patients with hypercarbia where carbon dioxide levels are higher and there is respiratory acidosis, they will be put on a mechanical ventilator which will ventilate the patient so as to take the carbon dioxide out. If the ventilator settings are such that ventilation is much more than required, more carbon dioxide may be removed and that is an important cause of respiratory alkalosis. Let us now summarize the causes of respiratory alkalosis either due to excessive stimulation 
of the brain stem respiratory center or due to excessive mechanical ventilation. This can happen when there is peripheral chemoreceptor stimulation, J receptor stimulation or direct stimulation of the respiratory center. Peripheral chemoreceptor stimulation happens in hypoxic states. J receptor stimulation can happen in edema and direct stimulation of the respiratory center happens in these conditions. Of these, this set of conditions can also be referred to by other names, hypoxic hypoxia or type 1 respiratory failure. We will go on to see what happens in asthma. Asthma is a condition where there is narrowing of the airways. Think of the alveoli being normal, but the airways that is the bronchioles bronchi have narrowed. It is therefore classified as an obstructive disease where there is an obstruction to air movement. It is an acute obstructive disease and there are chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases what we call COPDs. We will see them in the next session emphysema and chronic bronchitis. In these two conditions also there is narrowing of the airways and in those two conditions what you get is a respiratory acidosis. Therefore, in asthma too we would logically think that there will be a respiratory acidosis. That is not the case. More often than not the acid base disorder in asthma is a respiratory alkalosis and why might that occur? Is it narrowing of the airways that causes a hypoxia and is there a stimulation through peripheral chemoreceptors? Not really because if that narrowing was sufficient to cause hypoxia, it would have resulted in hypercarbia as well. So I think respiratory alkalosis occurs in asthma because of anxiety, difficulty in breathing creating anxiety in the patient and therefore there is tachypnea and actually hyperventilation which results in, met in respiratory alkalosis. This is a paper where they have examined 229 cases of acute asthma. The most common disturbance in nearly half the episodes was respiratory alkalosis. Respiratory acidosis was only in one fourth of the patients and metabolic acidosis in the remaining. So I did a small pie chart and we find that respiratory alkalosis is the most common presentation in acute asthma but you could also get respiratory acidosis and metabolic acidosis. We will now look at concomitant electrolyte abnormalities and respiratory alkalosis. In respiratory alkalosis, there is a reduction in carbon dioxide that leads to a reduction in bicarbonate. The kidneys are compensating by reducing bicarbonate so as to keep hydrogen ion concentration and pH from changing too much. So there will be a reduction in bicarbonate levels, but that space will be filled with chloride and there will be a hyperchloremia. We have seen when we dealt with metabolic alkalosis that any alkalosis when plasma pH is higher, calcium will move into the bound state and that will result in a hypocalcemia. Again in alkalosis there will be hypokalemia that is because of intercellular shifts, exchanges of protons and potassium. When there is alkalosis, some hydrogen ions will move from the cells into plasma so as to compensate and that will result in potassium translocating into the cells resulting in hypokalemia. So if all these compensatory mechanisms were to occur, why would you have an alkalosis at all? It is only after all these compensatory mechanisms are overwhelmed that the change in pH occurs. To summarize, the electrolyte abnormalities you might come across in respiratory alkalosis are a renal compensation by decreasing serum bicarbonate, 
hyperchloremia, hypocalcemia, and hypokalemia. We will look at some special signs in respiratory alkalosis, or rather alkalosis in general. The symptoms of respiratory alkalosis are primarily due to the reduced carbon dioxide. A reduction in carbon dioxide can cause vasoconstriction of brain vessels and that can lead to confusion, delirium, etc. But there is another set of signs that would develop due to the hypocalcemia that occurs in alkalotic conditions. These are due to increased neuromuscular excitability in hypocalcemia. Calcium is a membrane stabilizer and a reduction in plasma calcium can increase the excitability of the membranes. A reduction in external calcium can reduce contractility of the heart. The force of contraction may reduce, but the excitability of the heart and even before that, the excitability of nerves and muscles will be higher in hypocalcemic states. This can lead to twitchings or spasms of skeletal muscle. The sign called Chwostek sign is in a patient where you suspect alkalosis. If you tap the facial nerve at the point of exit here, there will be twitchings of the facial muscles. That is called Chwostek sign. And the small muscles of the hands and feet can go into spasm, what is called carpopedal spasm. This can be elicited if you put a blood pressure cuff around the arm and increase pressure to about 30 millimeters mercury, then you may be able to elicit the spasm in the hand and that is called Trousseau sign. So the carpal spasm is typically in hypocalcemia, flexion at the wrist, flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joints. The interphalangeal joints are not flexed. There is extension of the interphalangeal joints and adduction of the thumb and the fingers. This is the typical posturing in hypocalcemia. This is the carpal spasm. You would have noticed that in these sessions, we do not talk much about symptoms and signs of each condition that you will learn more elaborately when you go to your clinical years and the treatment of the conditions per se you will learn in pharmacology and in medicine. In physiology, the discussion is restricted to pathophysiology or mechanisms of disease. Thank you.